So I've had um, broad experience in media, in science and academia, uh, and in government and bureaucracy. And uh, I worked for the public broadcaster as a TV presenter and film producer for about 12 years in Australia. It's the ABC or the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which is different to the ABC in the US in that it's a wholly government funded, um, taxpayer funded broadcaster. So we don't have commercial influence, allegedly. Um, and I, uh, I uh, became a, a producer of long-form documentaries, uh, did a series of what were labelled controversial documentaries, poking at big pharma, big chemical, big tech, big, um, big food, and they uh, invited a lot of criticism from uh, vested interests. And as a public broadcaster, they found it very difficult to deal with the complaints. People were calling for my sacking constantly. I was being derided in the papers as pseudoscientific and controversial. And it was quite a coveted position and a very rare one uh, for you know people to. It, I was very, I felt very privileged because it was quite a, a powerful platform to showcase science, medicine, um, and do these types of investigations. And uh, ultimately, the controversy just led to the entire department being wiped out and I was cancelled. There was this orchestrated campaign to uh -huh. discredit me and uh -huh. people were attacking my PhD, alleging <clears throat> scientific fraud and I had to go through legal battles. So that was a, a period of five or six years of my life where I had to challenge um, you know, what was being thrown at me. Eventually, I just decided that I was going to become independent, um, not right in Australia. Couldn't get work in Australia because of what had happened. Um, but I think the, the biggest lesson for me was that it, it was not that I was special in any way. It was just, uh, I think, to take me down was a message, a strong message sent to other journalists that yeah. they shouldn't really yeah. um, attempt to do the same yeah. thing that you, I did. I'm getting a very strong impression that we have these things in, in this country called science journalists yeah. who are really just um, people who sign up to echo government propaganda. Is, um, and they're, they exist in all, all places, you know, the New York, New York Times, obviously, but, but other so popular, it's popular science as we know it. It's just, it strikes me over the last three and a half years has become just government propaganda. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah, I, I mean, I've worked in newsrooms and in factual documentary filmmaking, and my experience was similar to what Emily Cap Kaplan described, uh -huh. is that there are a lot of young people uh, in the ranks, they got rid of all the older, more experienced yeah. reporters with corporate knowledge. Young people were eager to impress, uh, overworked. It was all science by press release. Um, I had the privileged position of taking a long time to research stories, sometimes months, if not years. I'd film them over several weeks uh, and, and months. Uh, and that's the way you get proper investigation. Right, and that's just not, that's interesting. Right? I should be clear that everyone on this panel has experienced extraordinary life upheaval, um, having all of you been uh, in very conventional positions in, in, in science. Um, so, you know, that decision, um, whether you, there was a time when you actually made it, probably there was, or whether it was thrown at you is, is quite uh, psychologically disruptive, I would say. And I, uh, let me turn to you, Dr. Malone, about this subject, too, because I, I think about you all the time, and you have been, in many ways, uh, a godfather and teacher to us all during this pandemic, right? Uh, absolutely. The decision that you made to throw yourself into this battle was surely not an easy one, and you have paid a very big price, am I correct? I guess that's fair. Uh, it's, uh, I, so I, one of the things I lecture on all the time is I absolutely refuse to be a victim. 
uh, we're, we're embedded in a cultural milieu where victimization and self-victimization have become uh, the norm. And uh, I, and, and certainly there has been a concerted effort to delegitimize me uh, um, to buy from all sides. Uh, that's one of the most difficult things for me to manage psychologically is is the attacks coming from people that ostensibly I would think would be allies or had been allies in the past mm -hmm. and that's that's a hard one uh, for me personally and I've been told I need to by by senior advisors who have decades of experience in entertainment and uh, providing personal security and to people like Jeff Bezos and Bobby Kennedy uh, and I'm told well, I just need to shrug it off and not let it bother me. Uh, and my retort to that is if I became that person, hmm. I would have to no longer be the person that I've worked so hard to be uh, in seeking to build uh, my skills in interpersonal empathy. Uh, I, I, if you are going to be an empathic person, you will be open to the damage caused by uh, the psychological impact of these kinds of attacks. And to be immune to those would be to harden your heart in a way that would damage your soul uh, and damage, uh, in my case, what I have actively sought to be. Uh, it's It's been... Um, possible uh, for me to sustain the level of, uh, of malice that has been directed uh, in large part uh, for two reasons. One is that I have a refuge and uh, uh, we could call it Galt's Gulch or we could call it the uh, Cielo Azure Farms in Madison, Virginia. And the other is that I have had a lifelong partner since I was a young teenager, I won't tell you how young, uh, um, that I remain buried to. And uh, we've stood together and walked together and sustained the insults together. And that, I, I, I'm sorry to say that a number, I'm not unique in what I have experienced. Uh, there are many here in this audience that have experienced uh, what I have. Uh, and many who have uh, lost relationships uh, in, in the context of, of that barrage and the impacts. Uh, we're fortunate in having been able to stand together. But there's uh, no question that um, I and others have been subjected to uh, concerted, focused, uh, targeted efforts uh, to uh, um, engage in character assassination. There's no other word for it. Uh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of fancy words we can talk about, uh, but, but it is character assassination. And it's not, it's, it's, um, to be, not to, not to be hyperbolic. But it is kind of akin to rape. You're having something stripped from you. Uh, it's your history. It's what you've achieved. It's, it's the work product of your life that is being actively stripped from you uh, to uh, advance a political agenda that really is uh, agnostic about you. It's nothing about you. Uh, it's, and that helps somewhat in not, if, if you personalize it, uh, then, then it becomes really difficult psychologically to manage. If you can distance yourself from it and say, okay, this is being done uh, because there's an ulterior motive here, and you just happen to be the person in the way between those that are, have the power to do this and their objectives, and so they will uh, behave in this way because they are fundamentally unethical, and uh, their structure is built around uh, the logic of utilitarianism, that the ends justify the means, and that there are no ethical boundaries uh, that they will not cross in seeking to achieve that objective, whatever that objective is. In this case, as you've been covering in these other sessions, uh, that objective is justified based on some concept of the greater good, as it always is, right? Yes, of course. Um, uh, and, and so uh, anything is acceptable in pursuit of the objective of the common good, yeah. including crushing the individual. Yeah. 
Uh, and I guess also I have had the benefit of, as a very young person, because back then the state of California actually did have a gifted and talented program that's now politically unacceptable um, in their state schools. And so I had to read uh, The Death of Socrates in 1984 in Animal Farm yeah. and uh, Brave New World when I was, I don't know, 12? Yeah. Uh, and, and so those things were deep in my uh, uh, awareness base. Yeah. And, and so when these things happened, that gave me some uh, intrinsic strength yeah. uh, knowing that I had already been through the logic of where this goes. Uh, and and uh, so, uh, again, in closing, yeah. It's not very nice. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, wicked. It's evil. Um, it's apersonal. Uh, it is character assassination in a in a way. It's akin to rape in that you're having uh, your uh, persona stripped away from you, particularly as a professional that's invested so much time yeah. in trying to build that elusive CV and all of that stuff yeah. that academics accumulate yeah. in order to legitimize themselves and, and frankly to compete with other academics yeah. uh, and um, uh, uh, that's not very nice uh, it's not a whole lot of fun having that stripped away from you I think I, I stopped paying attention to the attacks on you a uh, long time ago what uh, what uh, maybe you can just remind us what, what was the most prominent you know, most aggressive assault that you faced vicious hmm uh, uh, hard to ring. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, Jeffrey, since you're giving me the, the, the mic. Yeah. Um, uh, Brownstone Institute just came out with a, uh, and it, it feeds back into the prior session, okay? So uh -huh. I'm creating a bridge. Brownstone just published a piece, kindly, that I had put out a few days ago that was uh, a, a detailed uh, um, expert sworn testimony that had been uh, stripped of its identifiers, uh, designed to support uh, legal cases for individuals who had been unfairly terminated due to unwillingness to accept the jab. Yeah. What that story did not include intentionally mm -hmm. uh, was the context. Uh, in, in that case, and it illustrates something that Cash Patel talks about in his new book, uh, um, but uh, there's an ecosystem here that's intentional. Uh, in that case, uh, that carefully developed sworn testimony citing government sources yeah. uh, was not allowed into court. That testimony was excluded from consideration. The case was thrown out. The reason it was excluded from consideration is because the defense cited two articles uh, which established uh, in the minds of the judge who kept referring to himself using the Imperial we, uh, we uh, cannot accept this because Dr. Malone by the New York Times and the Washington Post has been clearly established as a spreader of misinformation. Uh -huh. And therefore his sworn test, now this is hearsay and the lawyers will tell you that this is illegal um, to accept hearsay evidence uh -huh. in making a determination like this. But as Cash also points out in talking about the uh, Steele dossier, the, the ecosystem is that these actors, whoever we want to call them, he, he likes to call, he, he likes to refer to the deep state, uh, whatever euphemism you want to call it. These, these forces employ media to defame. And in my case, one of the most egregious ones was the Atlantic Monthly article that came out that had the cross in front of my face. Many people have asserted this is basically an invitation for assassination. Cross needles in front of my face. Uh, written by a young man who uh, um, 
mostly writes for the Chronicle for Higher Education uh, on woke, pro-woke pro stuff. Ah. Um, and uh, he he wrote this, uh, you know, very poorly written but rather defamatory uh, article um, that cast shade on everything about me, including Was it book. just you or uh, was that other people? No, it was just me. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, then, and this was funded by the Wellcome Trust and, uh, and the... Um, Zuckerberg Chan Foundation, uh, and uh, it's if you go and search my name on Google, it always comes to the top. It's being paid to be at the top of the search engine. Welcome Trust. Who knows Welcome Trust? Okay, Jeremy Farrar, oh. <laughs> Fauci's partner, burner phones, secret phone calls, lab leak, blah blah blah. Yeah, to get the picture. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's kind of the. Uh, Nonprofit foundation equivalent of Gates Foundation within the UK, yeah. but emerges directly out of the Welcome uh, com uh, Bill's Welcome Company. Yeah. Um, so uh, my point is only that the ecosystem works in uh, this aggressive, intentional defamation, slander, uh, delegitimization of someone who's a credible voice yeah. uh, in opposition, and then that feeds directly back into the legal system, wow. as Bobby was saying, uh -huh. because the legal system is totally uh, what we've seen, yeah. particularly down at the local level, which is where this case happened in San Diego. Um, the legal system is totally influenced by the perception of its base, which is the body electorate. Um, and so this this loops into well, why should I protest? Why should I raise my voice for the average person on the street? Um, and the reason is because the judiciary, which we thought, it, I naively thought, was an objective determinant of uh, right and wrong. At least you didn't think it was Wikipedia. Is, right. is totally the judiciary is totally um, uh, responsive to perceived uh, public. Uh, consensus. Right. And so when we have a, a public that is, uh, as was mentioned, uh, basically seeking totalitarianism. Um, uh, the judiciary is in a position where why should we buck the trend? Yeah. Right. Um, there's nothing good in that for us. We're just right. going to get a lot of heat, um, and so hence the judge is speaking in the in the plural we. Uh, believe that this is what we should do, uh, irregardless of what the law says. Um, and so I guess that it's uh, the, the most damaging has been this targeted intentional press defamation, which is absolutely not unique to me. Yeah. Um, uh, it, you, you, you can see Matt Getz is a great example who has risen above it, who refused to allow all the defamation to stick, mm -hmm. um, persevered, and is now one of the most important uh, voices in the House right now. I think we could all agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, that that gets to my point of uh, my advice to all of you. Choose a role, just don't make it the victim. Mm. Um, you can be a warrior, you can be a mentor, uh, you can be a nurturer, don't be a victim. Don't allow them to define you as a victim. And as we were, Jill and I were grappling with all of this, um, uh, the epiphany came, we need to be like Ronald Reagan. We need to be happy warriors. And so we almost almost daily remind each other, we have to be happy warriors. We cannot let this beat us down. Yeah, well, I lost my happiness March 2020, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, somebody, somebody pointed out that my old picture is I was always smiling, and now I'm always frowning, so yeah, there you go. Uh, Simon, uh, you started, you wanted a conventional scientific career. You're a young man. You went through all the right steps. Something went wrong. <laughs> Why are you living in the Brazil? Rainforest. Oh yeah, raising fish. Yeah. Uh, the fish story is like some defamatory story they put out. Um, oh, okay. But okay, it's, 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 it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I'm not raising fish. Um, so I was um, mid beginnings of thirties, which is um, quite the beginning of a scientific career. I had approximately one thousand citations per year, which is very good for my for my young age. 
I actually want to do is there is the microphone working for you? Yeah. It is. It is. Okay, try now. Yeah. Um, uh, I, yeah, one thousand yeah. citations for, for uh, approximately. Um, and yeah, I was I want to do the um, tenure track. Um, which means to become a professor, you know, uh, that's, that's what you do in Europe, but I don't know how it is in the US. Um, and at one point, a friend of mine said, like, Simon, you're an editor of a journal. Um, look at this paper here from Christian Drostenmeier and Copelands and Co. It was about the PCR test, the um, COVID PCR protocol. And I, was, I was looking into this and I was like, okay, submitted on the same day as it was published. I was like, That's, <laughs> that must have been a mistake, but it was no mistake. And I was, um, back then, I think I had like 100, 20, 300 followers on Twitter, so small as account you can imagine. Um, and I was just writing a thread about it. I was explaining the peer process, and I was questioning um, that this paper ever um, was actually put into this process, so that it was actually peer reviewed. Um, I was submitting the thread, it was like, one like, I was like, one like, wow, nice. <laughs> Who is this person? I woke up the next day, uh, several thousand followers more, and 10,000 likes or something. So uh, it went viral, obviously, someone, sh someone shared it. And uh, this was the beginning of being cancelled from the Dutch University. Um, so they've been told, yeah, from above, um, they said from above, someone told us that we can't keep you here. So this was the first time, and I was like, shit, you know, young scientist, what am I going to do now? So um, I moved to the Brazilian jungle because also my bank account uh, was uh, disabled, frozen, whatever you want to call it. Um, I got into trouble without getting in trouble. So they're just canceling me silently and uh, no income, no access to money. And uh, I was using Denise's bank account <laughs> to the marriage who saved me more or less. So um, yeah, I moved to the jungle and I um, then worked, um, started working for a Norwegian company. Um, Research uh, Institute from Norway. Um, it worked out because my Twitter account got uh, suspended for um, posting my vitamin D paper. Um, this was considered medical misinformation. Um, and yeah, I was I was actually living a good life as a scientist until until January 23 when when Elon Musk thought it was a smart move to give me, to give me my account back. Um, so I got my account back and immediately cancelled again within three days. So um, yeah, this is. This is actually the story, and the fun, fun fact is like Robert was saying, like, okay, defamatory articles, etc. so media was looking into him. They did the same with me, but they never tried to fact check my, my claims on the PCR test. The only thing that fact checked are my memes. So whenever I put a meme, Yahoo or CNN, I would say like, oh, this meme is, is, is misinformation. That's like, <laughs> I was like, it's a meme. <laughs> I know, why do memes exist? So, it's, uh, so only my memes get fact checked by the media. Um, so right now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping like Robert. I think being offended is a choice. It's the only way you can you can really make it through this uh, um, infodemic, whatever you want to call it. Um, so if I would be suspect, um, I'm offended every time someone uh, attacks me on on Twitter or or some of these uh, some of these uh, Soros journalists, I would be offended 24/7. So this is not an option. So I, I just ignore it. I uh, you know I go my own way. I uh, I'm, I'm I'm not writing a book. Uh, you know about that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm just trying to pursue my way and. Of of course, I, I cannot enter academia anymore. So actually, my career is destroyed. So I have to find an alternative career, yeah. and that's what I'm doing. Yep. Uh, Ramesh Thacker, when uh, Kofi Annan became a UN secretary, he tagged you to be his deputy secretary. You've lived a very uh, prestigious life as a scientist and an academic. Um, what have these times meant for you? And let me add that his book. Ruth House just came out a couple of days ago. We're all very excited. We all love his writings on Brownstone. So just tell us, and we're going to hear it later from you tonight, but go ahead. Uh, a couple of things. Firstly, Robert, you, you, you mentioned Socrates, uh, and you said how you've had a long and satisfying married life. Uh, I've been married for 48 years as well uh, now. Uh, just a, an anecdote that you might like before I get to your thing. Uh, one of these verified student bloopers, uh, a kid had written that Socrates is, is famous in history for having died from an overdose of wedlock. <laughs> uh, 
in terms of the themes we have traversed through the day, can I point out firstly that uh, even though I have emeritus status, I am not an active professor uh, at the Australian National University. Uh, through all my writings, which have been very critical of lockdowns and mask mandates and vaccine mandates, including by the ANU itself that has Im imposed them, I have not criticized my own university, but I've been critical of these. I have never even been queried, let alone rebuked or censored by my university. Mm. Uh, that I'm in a privileged position for whatever the reason, uh, and from their point of view, they can now look back as the narrative unravels. And if they are criticized, they can say, well, you know, here's one of our professors who's actually been saying this, and we have allowed him to say it. So it's, it's a protection for them as well. So that's worth saying. Secondly, Paul Dirac, how many remember that, how many recognize the name? Paul Dirac, a Swiss English physicist, Nobel laureate from 1933, I think, a protege of Werner Heisenberg, who got the physics Nobel Prize in 1932. Uh, Dirac went on to England, one of his parents was from there, but not surprisingly, given they were in the same field, uh, Heisenberg, I think it was Heisenberg, the surname, Heisenberg and Dirac formed a personal bond and friendship. Uh, Heisenberg stayed working uh, under the Nazi regime uh, and afterwards Dirac maintained his friendship and for that he was criticized by quite a lot of other colleagues. Uh, and there's a lovely explanation from him which is, which is the point of the story and that is it's easy to be a hero in a democracy. And I say that because this question has come up, how and why did the doctors go along? How and why did the intellectuals go along? Why did we, in this privileged uh, environment, uh, comply with this? And I want to turn that around. I think if even 10% of the doctors and the professors and the credible journalists had taken it on, it would have collapsed. You just need a minority. Now, I don't want to judge any of them. I do not know the individual circumstances. Uh, I was very fortunate in that I was already retired. They couldn't sack me. Uh, I was also unusual in that when I said I was retired, I had meant it and I had refused to accept any commitments for beyond my thing other than seeing through the PhD students who were still midway in their thesis. Uh, and then that when that was done, I refused to write academic articles. I refused to review manuscripts. I refused to review book manuscripts of which you used to do uh, six to 10 a year and stuff like that. So I, that meant that I had both the opportunity without threat of being cancelled and the time and freedom to go back to what academics love doing, follow, solve intellectual puzzles uh, and the discrepancy between what I had known before and done, done this. But the Dirac story, if you think about that, the fact that so many of our current people were unable to challenge the narrative suggests in itself that we are no longer under practicing democratic regimes. It would have had to be a hero like Robert Malone to challenge. And that's a telling anecdote to illustrate the title of the book that we just done, Our Enemy, the Government. Now, to go back to the substance of that, I mean, when they asked me to be on this panel, I said, you do realize I'm not a scientist, I'm not, I have no medical qualifications whatsoever. And they said, well, you approach it from the policy side, uh, even if it's started off with international policy from the UN. It is important and it's irrelevant. Uh, I worked, broadly speaking, in global governance issues, which includes but was not limited to uh, health and pandemics. I did a, a co-authored a book on global governance, which actually is the most successful book on that subject still and used quite a lot. And one of the chapters is on pandemics and health. We from the United Nations University set up a new institute in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur on global health. So we looked, I looked into that from that point of view as well. For my sins, I used to co-organize and co-chair a meeting of the entire UN system worldwide, bringing together research parts, 
with their counterparts on the consumer side, clientele side within the UN system. And the same things that you hear about in public about, you know, they don't speak the same language and the vocabulary, they talk past each other, the practitioners are not interested in what the people are saying, they rather have advice from the top prestigious institutions like Harvard and Stanford, and the, and the complaints from the researchers that they'd rather go outside and look at what's being done within the system, even though it's saying the same thing sort of thing. So the, the point was there, and, and, and the effort to try and connect data and theory to policy, distill it into what it means in policy terms. So that was there. I was also involved for several years in a small group under the leadership of former Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin on the merits of and the mechanics of elevating the finance minister G20 as it used to exist since 97, which Paul Martin and Larry Summers had set up. Uh, how to elevate that into a leader's level, which it has now become. But we were involved in a small group in advocating for that. And you're exploring the topics of international crises that might trigger such a shift upwards to leadership level summit. And we looked at nuclear disaster, we looked at terrorism, uh, we looked at a major health pandemic as a trigger to that, and we looked at financial crisis, which is the one that actually was then used to activate it. So with all these, I had some familiarity with the health issue and the pandemic issue in particular, and I was aware of the existing state of knowledge and how that we had tried to translate that into policy when the need arose. And then finally, in terms of the personal story, for just over a month, mid-February to mid-March 2020, I was with my family in India and watched this unfold from India and my family is part of the deep interior, even by Indian standards. And two conclusions were very evident being present there at the time. One, under Indian conditions, and we're talking about, remember, over a billion people, under Indian conditions, lockdowns are physically impossible. And the state simply doesn't have the administrative capacity to enforce lockdowns, both these factors. But the second reality was the immense devastation it would cause at the human level to individuals and families where the vast majority of your labor force works as casual labor in the informal sector and as casual daily wage laborer. What is someone who earns his daily living from driving a manual rickshaw? What's he going to do if you take away his livelihood for even one week, let alone a month or a year? You can predict the harms in terms of child trafficking, in terms of child labor, in, in terms of suicides, in terms of domestic abuse of uh, wives as well as children. All that was very quickly a reality in terms of imagining the world. And so I go back to that and then back to the intellectual puzzle. I said, okay, we've had all this national pandemic preparedness plans, the ones I have looked at myself, uh, UK, Canada, US, Australia, and I'm sure there are many others. I went back and refreshed myself with the state of the art synthesis on pandemic preparedness that the WHO published yeah. in September 2019, yeah. not very old. And all of them were consistent in the message that non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns, like mask mandates, uh, uh, travel restrictions are strongly not recommended. Yeah. If necessary, you can institute them for very short term of one to two weeks to ramp up your health infrastructure, hospital beds, ICU beds, so that you don't get overwhelmed. But the longer you leave it, the more damage you cause. And the, and the cost will be paid once you open up again. So the puzzle was, on what basis did we abandon that? Why? Where is the data? Completely dubious data from Wuhan, from one city? That doesn't gel. Where is the theory? There is none. 
Well, sorry, science doesn't progress like that. This is not. This is anti-science in terms of existing established science. So that's why I began working on this. And I tell you, and I'll finish with this, by the end of 2020, I was saying, I'm done. I've said what I want to say. I want to get back to my retirement life, go back to life of ease. What changed my mind was the letters and messages and phone calls I got from two groups of people. One, the ordinary people who said, look, you have a voice, you have a status, you have a global platform. The things you are saying makes a lot of sense to us and no one else is saying it. Mm. It gives us hope, please don't stop. And the second group, which was even more surprising, was doctors and surgeons who said, no, your understanding of medical science is actually better than most doctors and you're able to explain it in a public way. That is very important. You are our voice as well, and we will give you the data so long as you don't attribute it to us. <laughs> but please keep writing. So again, I, mean, I, I, I also discussed this with my wife, and she said, look, you have a duty. Whether you want to or not, you, the, what they're saying is correct. And you have to sp keep speaking for them because it gives them a measure of hope. So the thing that I drew a line at and I was very careful about was if they called me for actual medical advice, I said, look, please talk to your doctor. What I can tell you is these are the questions you want to ask your doctor. And, if you, and, and, and before you ask the questions, ask them if they are in a position, referencing, I think something that in the first panel someone said, I don't think it was David or someone else, the, the doctor-patient relationship, the, the Hippocratic Oath. The first question you ought to ask your doctor is, are you going to be able to give me your individual best professional opinion? Or are you under instructions to repeat the government line? If the latter, change doctor, find someone who says, yes, they're prepared to give you that. And you know, some doctors are reported when they give this frank advice as well. So that's how I got involved in this, and that's how I have not been able to get out of it. <laughs> You're so passionate. I, I, one of the, it's, it's a joy for me uh, to be on the receiving end of your, your submissions, uh, because you know you check your email, and when there's something from Ramesh Thacker, I say, oh, here we go. <laughs> and uh, it's happening you know, about once a week, and I'm so grateful for that. You, by the way, your story of India and the poor reminds me, you know, one of the states that didn't lock down um, in the world, I mean, I think there were like five, right? But one of them was Nicaragua, and and my old nemesis uh, Daniel Ortega. I say that because I met all of his cabinet ministers when I was, you know, three years old. Um, during, I, I took a trip there in the late 1980s. Um, with I was in co I just finished college, um, so he's like this communist guy. But when when the UN told him to, to when the WHO told him to lock down, he said we can't we can't do that. Uh, we're too poor. We can't lock down. So they never did anything in Nicaragua. Actually, it's one of the few states in the world that didn't do it. Um, in any case, what I'm hearing from all of you, and I'm sure there's some agreement about this, is. You know, the failure of science. I, I worry about this because the loss of trust in everything seems to have affected everyone and everything. It's governments, it's media, but it's also science itself. Uh, you know, can we really, it, you know, it used to have some status just a few years ago. Now it's not so clear. So um, I wonder if you, we have any suggestions here on, on what we need to, need to do besides just continuing to speak out, which I'm, everyone's here is grateful for, for all four of you for continuing to do that. But um, what, are the, what are the prospects for rebuilding respect for science in the, in the future? And, you know, are, are we looking at decades? Or is this just a temporary setback? Leave it open to anyone. I'd uh, say it would take years. Um, it, it's such a multi-pronged approach. I think transparency is essential. The problem um, is that we haven't had access to data. Journalists, even submitting FOIs, have them returned fully redacted or largely redacted. So we need better, more transparent information. Mm -hmm. 
and then there's this giant elephant in the room of corporate regulatory capture yeah. um, of these public health institutions. And people have been talking about this for decades. It's, it's come to a, um, a climax with COVID. How do we get pharmaceutical funding out of the drug regulators? People have hypothesized lots of things, having an independent drug regulator that is not funded by the pharmaceutical company, assessing the FDA's regulatory right. decisions, I and mean, it feels like it's all doubling up. But so, I to your mind, the, the pharmaceutical uh, profits um, have have subsidized the, the, basically the corruption of, of the whole scientific world. Yeah, I did this investigation for the BMJ last year and looked at the level of pharmaceutical funding for six of the major drug regulators uh, in the world. And Australia was the top in terms of receiving 97% of its funding operational budget from drug industry fees. Yeah. Um, the UK's MHRA receives about 86% of its funding from drug fees, and I think the U.S. was about... Uh, 40%, 50? 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, before people will trust yeah. authorities and public health in, health in, institutions. Yeah. Well, I guess the collapse in, in Pfizer and Moderna stock prices is, is a good start. Right. So that's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. good. Although it's plateaued in the last week. Just, uh -oh. just <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, can, can, yeah. I, can I tackle that question also? I think it depends partly or quite not partly, quite a lot on how they deal with where we are now. In the sense that if there were to be an acceptance and public acknowledgement, public mea culpa, from the public health authorities, that would be a great stimulus to regaining trust and confidence. Yeah. One of the things that has happened, you know, we've talked all day, and we've, we've all, many of us have written about this, the collapse of the old left-right distinctions mm -hmm. for practical purposes. One of the things that they have got away with by raising these censorship issues and labeling us anti-vaxxers and conspiracy nutters and stuff like that, is they have successfully diverted attention away from their failure to invest in public health expenditure at a level that would be adequate to meet emergencies. I mean, the reason I was involved in these pandemic preparedness things and trying to agitate was this is a predictable thing. Someday we will face a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You need to be prepared for that now. In the middle of it, you'll be caught short. So you're saying the absence of public funding led to... Uh, well, WHO, WHO, you know, David has written about it. I wrote Kofi Annan's reform report in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a... A very satisfying thing to say I, the Secretary General, have decided and be writing that sort of thing. Uh, but as a result, I had access to any data I wanted from the UN system. When we began with the WHO in the UN system, the funding, including the WHO, the funding goes is assessed contributions and then voluntary contributions. Voluntary contributions, sometimes also called extra budgetary support. Assessed contributions are those that are decided upon by the organization itself and member states have to pay. Voluntary contributions, they can decide to top it up to suit the need, to meet the needs that are there. When we began, the assessed contributions was 75%. Voluntary contributions were only 25%. So the WHO was protected against donor capture. Mm -hmm. By the time I write the report in 2002, the balance has, it's not quite completely reversed, but it's more than 50% already yeah. is voluntary, is dedicated. It's mainly at that time from governments, and between then and now, the proportion of the Gates Foundation has kept going up as well. And they direct what they want. 
So it's like the regulatory agencies, it's donor capture, uh, and David's written very well on those things, and you can see the present distribution of funding things there. So if your money is coming from there, follow the money. The, 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 you, you see this with the Tamiflu uh, controversy with WHO, and so many governments ended up buying these flus that were then thrown out, of, and pharmaceutical uh, companies made money as well. So we need to go back to those things also. But, and, and then it, it, you know, it, it just keeps getting layers and layers. We had this state border closures in Australia. Well, as it is, Australia compared to the United States is a very small population country. But at least at a national level, you can rationalize your vacant beds and fly people in in emergencies to wherever the vacancies are. But if you start closing things, then every state has to have redundancy, not just nationally. And that breaks down. But we had people die because they were not allowed to cross borders yeah. to access the hospital that was near to and people, meaning we had one or two twins uh, still in the womb, had to be sacrificed because of this factor, the government closing the borders. And there's another case from Adelaide to Sydney, so the flight, or Melbourne, the flight didn't take place, I can't remember. Them. So it's these things. We, we can do that. If, however, they don't acknowledge the mistakes, yeah. and they double down on, no, we did the right, right. thing under the circumstances, then the chances of regaining public trust and confidence are going to be yeah. much, much lower. Yeah. Robert, go. Okay, I want to go micro to macro. Um, I know from direct personal experience, the WHO is intensely corrupt. Okay, I had a client directly get hustled by the Director General during the Ebola crisis for a donation when there was a decision that my client's vaccine product, originally developed by Canada, was going to become the lead vaccine candidate for Ebola. I, long story, we ended up selling it to Merck. But I, I experienced that directly. Okay, the, the WHO is notoriously corrupt. Micro. More macro. Uh, we are locked in the loop of thinking about the COVID crisis. And we're not recognizing the parallel of, for instance, the climate crisis, yep. which has the same ecosystem. Yep. Okay? Um, and if we, if we go up above that, what we see is that there is this, and I'm going to call it a false religion. We use the term scientism. It's not technically an accurate term to reflect. Scientism is, is the belief system that uh, the only things that are true and real are that which we can observe and detect. That's scientism. But we use it as a euphemism for this uh, kind of uh, large science uh, um, weaponization to advance uh, other agendas, including political, economic, uh, power agendas. Uh, and that's what's really going on, is the mantle of science, which has come to replace the mantle of religion in terms of public perception of uh, um, authority, yeah. uh, of, of uh, being an arbiter of, of truth and correctness in the world, has, be, has become weaponized and assimilated for other agendas. Uh, and, and you can see that again and again and again. And as that, I mean, there's there's down at the micro level, there's all of the long-standing corruption that exists within academe and the whole funding cycle and the growth of these uh, mafias, scientific mafias that compete with each other, etc. All of that was pre-existing substructure that then got revealed under the pressure of this particular event so that we can now perceive it in a way that we could not previously perceive it, unless you happen to be one of the poor bastards that was in the mill um, and, and you were seeing it all around you, but there's nothing you could say about it. Nobody would care. They wouldn't believe you, as you were saying. But I think the real issue here is the macro one which is that uh, the cloak of science, the, the robes of, of science as a religion, the priesthood of science as a religion has been co-opted to advance other agendas. And we see that in so many different ways now. And once that's happened, 
uh, and and the public is is able to perceive that 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 has has been um, co-opted and subjugated to advance other agendas, including economic ones. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as uh, Ernst Wolf, I think I first encountered very very eloquently uh, demonstrating the cascade of events that led to this massive upward transfer of wealth during this COVID crisis. Uh, um, once once that happened and people became aware of it, they became aware that science as they thought it was, this priesthood, this uh, ivory tower uh, priesthood uh, that was so noble, um, is not noble at all. Uh, that it is just as corrupted as the cop on the corner, uh, then suddenly we have a massive failure of a major pillar of current society. And uh, what I think our future is, is not one of uh, the challenge of rebuilding faith in science. I think it's the challenge of rebuilding faith in culture in Western culture, and that we succumb to a, a nihilism of, uh, um, of disaffection uh, from the culture surrounding us uh, because uh, we've lost one of the last remaining pillars of what we thought were the guardians of truth yeah. because they have been co-opted. Yeah. And um, I, I'm, I'm with you uh, that uh, the rebuild is going to be a challenge and I'm currently being asked by various parties to figure out what could be done about the FDA. And I don't want to be a total nihilist and say that we just got to burn the place down because that's the easy answer. Um, well, I think that's the right answer actually. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are some, some things that we can do uh, just like Cash is talking about how to rebuild justice. Yeah. Uh, but uh, are we going to rebuild uh, the faith of the, is it 20%? Um, is it 30 percent of the population that are now awake and can perceive what has transpired here and is continuing to be transpired in the context of uh, climate change and other and the, and the energy agenda and everything yeah. else. Um, I I I think we're you know you want to talk about dark winter. I think we're in for uh, some dark politics uh, and and I'm not sure how we get from here to there except through. Uh, the kind of decentralized uh, small group committee community uh, rebuild that, that many of us talk about, which and is and kind some, of some dark going economics. back to the Middle Ages. Yep, some dark economics about which we'll talk here in a few minutes. And Marianne, what's the last word? Just quickly on what Ramesh said about why public health authorities don't come out and say, we're sorry, we mm -hmm. got it wrong. Um, yeah. You know, this is even pre COVID when I challenged public health officials about why they would recommend a certain dietary advice that you know turned out to be uh, detrimental to people with diabetes, for example. Um, all of them really expressed concern about uh, people coming back and suing uh, the public health or government for harm that was done for advice that they took from these public health authorities. Yeah. So they're very reluctant to ever admit that they've done something wrong, the uh -huh. best you get, the best you get is the science changed, so our uh -huh. changes uh -huh. the science. I, I hadn't actually thought about that. That's that's really interesting. That that may account for the for the absence of the mea culpas. Yeah. All right. We'd like to thank all four of you for your voices, your faith, your courage. Mm -hmm.